Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, so yeah, so the, the talk has slightly changed title. Um, declarative Elm Disease, I think, is an interesting title uh, for the sake of the pun. Um, but this is probably more what the talk is actually about. Um, so uh, so that's, why, that's why you see this here. So um, before I start, has everyone or anyone here used a functional language before? Hands up if you haven't. So everyone seems... <laughs> 30 years ago. Brilliant. Uh, that's fine. Um, it's, only, it's only a bit of knowledge that will help. It means that... Uh, so they've got two kind of versions. So if, if everyone's sort of familiar with the general ideals, I'll go through the functional principles and syntaxy stuff, um, either quickly or probably not at all. Um, and I'll go straight into Elm and code and, and, and doing stuff that's sort of real worldy, um, rather than just syntax, because I think everyone would probably be okay with the syntax. Um, so cool. So this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, so what's coming up? So first of all, I'm just gonna introduce myself. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit about a problem that I personally had, um, and I'm sure that because I had it, I'm sure a lot of other people have had a similar problem. So uh, I'm then going to talk a little bit about what, what, it, what I did to go off and learn how to solve um, that kind of problem that I had. Uh, I chose, uh, in this instance, Elm, because I was interested in functional programming, and I'd heard it was very good um, to use on, on the front end, which is where my problems were in, in web clients. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can use that to solve your own problems. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did, how I used that knowledge to solve the problem I had in the first place. Um, so to answer that first question, who am I? Uh, my name is Jason Dreyer-Smith. I've been an engineer for nearly 10 years, but I started in electronics, then I did firmware, and then I did um, some server -y embedded stuff, and then now I'm on the web uh, and do web stuff. Um, I work for a company called Market Invoice. Um, we are a financial services company. We help SMEs with cash flow. Um, so that's a little bit where I come from. Uh, and full disclosure, finally, I'm not a master of Elm, and I'm not a contributor. You know, I'm not, I didn't write the compiler or anything like that. Uh, I'm just a big fan. Uh, so if you've got very deep questions, I may not be able to answer them. Um, and I'm sorry about that, but I will to the best of my ability. Um, I hope there's still some interesting stuff. I'll get that out of the way. So uh, next question, what was my problem? Um, so I would work sort of in a full stack environment. Uh, and on the web, that means you do a sort of code on the server that does hard work. Um, and then there's a client, which is a web client, which has got you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, JavaScript for your interaction, uh, HTML for your presentation, and then CSS to make it look pretty. Um, and in that environment, I had a load of problems. I was using uh, in a, a library or a framework uh, for building web clients called Angular. Uh, which has two-way binding, um, which is naturally at times quite difficult. Knowing who's in control of the state uh, can sometimes be a bit hairy in complex applications. Uh, so where is the state? You can have state in a number of different places. Um, in this, You can have it in the DOM, which obviously holds state in the form of the stuff you can view. You can hold it in JavaScript, and in Angular there's a few different um, things that are provided where you can put state. Um, JavaScript is inherently dynamic, um, so you have to do an awful lot of stuff uh, to do little dances to find out what on earth you're you doing or what data uh, you're playing with. Um, in reference to that, you can see a line um, here of, of JavaScript. These are all analogous. So an object plus an array is equal to zero, um, of course. Uh, an array plus an object is equal to an object. Um, so JavaScript, a bit crazy. Uh, so views, HTML. So to do a lot of stuff in HTML, you tend not to be writing HTML tend to be writing HTML with stuff in there that says do things like, if I have a binding to a list of objects, do a list of HTML elements and all that kind of stuff. So is the HTML really HTML? Is it, you know, it seems to be something else. Uh, more things that you can do in JavaScript which are dangerous, changing uh, at runtime what types are and what they do in a, not just a dynamic way, but in a forever breaking way. Um, MVC is a bit rubbish. Um, once again, this moving state around is. Anyway, all of these problems, li whole lists of problems I was really upset with, uh, and Angular as well is slow. So I thought, let's go, let's go learn something different um, that's gonna, th that either is some, you know, someone else's idea to solve these problems or, um, uh, or just maybe something interesting to get, get rid of these problems. So this is, uh, this is the analogy and the reason why I use sometimes 
when you're out of your comfort zone doing something else, you might learn something. Uh, that's where the magic happens. Uh, so now I'm going to go a little bit into the functional stuff. So the tools I chose were a functional tool because that's what I was interested in at the time. So it seems everyone's fairly up to speed with, with functional stuff. So I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, but there's some snippets in there about what Elm's approach to those things are. So um, it's hard learning functional stuff, but everyone here has been done that, so it's not hard for you. It's all like, it's all nice kittens. Um, so first of all, uh, we've got a type system. Uh, this is fairly common uh, in functional languages to have these kind of main kinds of type. So we've got uh, an alias, uh, which is like saying, here's a primitive. Um, I want to give that primitive some other um, uh, identifier. Um, so I know that I can't get two of the same kind of primitive mixed up if they mean something different in your domain. So, for instance, I have a first name and I have uh, or a first name and a surname or a last name. Um, they're both strings, maybe, in a piece of software. But actually, in your model, in your domain, a first name and a surname or a last name are different things, right? So you shouldn't ever say in a function that takes your first name, pass a surname. So we can give an alias to those types and say, these two strings are actually a first name and a last name. Uh, a union type, so this is, uh, this is like an enum in, in a lot of languages. Um, it's like saying a tag for something, um, a label. Uh, you can attach a little bit of extra information to a union if you want to, so you can put in a little bit of data there as well, um, which I'll see examples of. Uh, a tuple, or a tuple, um, which is sort of like a bucket for things, so it's this fixed sized bucket. Um, you can put different kinds of types of things in um, simply uh, a record, uh, and a record is sort of a collection of attributes named properties uh, in its simplest form. Uh, Elm also has uh, all of the other, most languages um, have all of these other useful primitives. So in, in Elm, unlike in JavaScript, we have int and float. Um, we've got strings, uh, we've got arrays, uh, dictionaries, and lists. Uh, and in Elm, specifically, lists uh, differ. Um, from arrays in other ways, but they're essentially a linked list um, underneath. So that's a useful, uh, useful thing to know. So that's our type system. Uh, quite simple, but there's a lot we can do with it. So the other thing uh, that's, that's interesting about most uh, functional languages, and, and Elm, uh, Elm carries this as well, is, is immutability. Uh, so once you've created something, sorry? All <laughs> right. No. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, so it's immutable. This means that once you've created something, um, you can't necessarily change the value of the properties of that thing. Uh, so this is really cool uh, for a lot of good thing, uh, a lot of good reasons. One of the reasons people talk about it a lot is this is good for concurrency. Uh, this is because you know that somebody else can't be changing the data that you're currently using. Um, I think is the, the reason why they that's uh, that's often lauded around. Uh, also, as just as a Mendham at the end, in, in Elm, uh, this is used when it's dealing with the DOM um, in that it says if something is referentially the same, which is how it uh, deals with stuff in the, red, in the, uh, the runtime, time, then it also must be structurally the same. Because if it was immutable, if it's the same reference, then it must not have changed, uh, which is quite useful. Um, yes, uh, in some regards. So the type system is is immutable. Um, but here, it's, it, the immutability. I'm, I'm purely saying is uh, that properties and values uh, once set can't be changed. Um, which I, I, is the, the simplest way that I can, I can think of describing it. Uh, the type system as well. Uh, so the types don't change if, if, you, if you change your value type systems. Uh, static as well and immutable. Yeah, I, I get the feeling there's a number of different Yes, it's, a broad, it's probably a broad term. But in the context of, of Elm uh, and these, the tools I'm using here, um, I think that, that definition probably suffices uh, for now. Um, so 
Uh, purity is our next, uh, or purity of, um, of functions is our next uh, point that often is pretty uh, common in functional languages and is definitely apparent in Elm. Um, so uh, the way we said here is if a function always returns the same value, we're given the same set of arguments. So if we give uh, the function add one and two, we will always get three um, as a basic example. Um, so there's no side effects. Uh, so the, the reason why this is easily tested is because you can give your test a function and a set of inputs, and you know you can always test that set of outputs. There's no um, side effects or other bits of state you might have to worry about affecting, um, affecting that function. Um, I think that's the reason why a lot of people say that functional language is easy to reason about. I think that's generally the reason why they're easy to reason about. Um, but it's quite, quite worth mentioning. So there's no, uh, there's no state as such. So um, the idea is that your data is flowing through functions. Um, at no point is that data seemingly at rest uh, in your application. It is in the Elm runtime, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but generally, you can, you can think of the fact that the state is never at rest. It's always, it's always moving through functions. Uh, so you don't have to worry about, as I talked before, in Angular, you've got bits of flates, fl state floating around in different places. Um, so yeah, Elm run, the, the runtime deals with a lot of, a lot of the things that uh, you might need to do in a real application uh, to get around that. I think it's a, a bit of a joke, right, that Haskell um, will, never have, will never give you any problems because it will never interact with the real world because you can't, you, can't, right, you can't do I.O. <laughs> Um, you can, but you know, it's a funny joke. Um, so partial application uh, is another one. This is this is quite um, uh, quite apparent. This is done in most like, functional languages, at least that I know. Uh, so I, I struggled with coming up with a definition uh, for this one in this context. Um, a function called with one argument will return the same function with one less arity. I mean, it's it's, it's close, but I, I think it's easier to to show than it is to to explain. If I'm honest. So we can do it in a few lines of, of JavaScript here. So we have a function uh, we've called a, which takes uh, one argument. And that returns a function called b that takes another argument. And that function returns x times a. So we've kind of created a closure around this second function uh, inside the first function. Uh, this means that if we want to, we can call a uh, twice with two arguments, so two and two. And what will happen is function A will uh, have a value of x of 2. Function B will have a value of y with 2. Um, and then when function B is called because of the closure that's been created, um, x has value 2, y has value 2. And we return, uh, return 4. And equally, what we can do is we can just call the first function to create the new function that has that closure there. Right? So here we've called A with 2, which means now we have a function that we can call multiply by 2. Um, in this instance. So Elm does this with all of your functions um, and a lot of other functional languages do similar sort of thing, right? a pattern called partial application, uh, which is very useful. Um, so those are the core concepts um, before we go on to uh, talking about Elm specifically. Um, cool. Let's look at this. So now let's talk about what actually uh, Elm is, apart from those things we've just mentioned. So. Elm is installed with, or can be installed with NPM, uh, which is a package manager for Node, which is a server-side JavaScript um, uh, set of tools. Um, it transpiles to JavaScript. Uh, at the moment, I believe, it transpiles to JavaScript that mostly has to be run uh, in a browser as it interacts with the DOM. Uh, I'm not sure that you can run Elm um, on the server uh, in Node, but um, I might be wrong on that. People might be doing it, and I'm just not aware. Uh, so the runtime is packaged with the build files, um, so an awful lot of things that you do in Elm are declaratively saying what you want to happen, and then asking the runtime to do it for you, and then getting something back from the runtime that you might be expecting um, to have happened. Uh, it's functional, as we mentioned. Uh, it talks about being reactive, uh, although I think they're trying to distance themselves from the FRP, or functional reactive programming, moniker that they had when Elm first started. Um, it's reactive in that uh, the program will respond to events um, and flow state changes through your, through your application in response to events. Um, strongly typed uh, with generics. So the type system we said, talked about before, it's, uh, it's strongly typed. There are other languages like Clojure and things like that which are dynamic. Um, this one isn't. Uh, but it does have generics. So. Uh, there's this idea that the type system is more of a dial than um, a hard rule. 
Uh, so if you dial back the type and don't declare it, the runtime will make an attempt to work out the generics for, um, for your particular application on the basis of its usage. Uh, and then we get profit, right? Because all these things are amazing things that we're all big fans of. Uh, so this is a quick uh, diagram. This is the only kind of like system level diagram that I'm going to show. Hopefully everything else will be obvious in code. Um, so the idea in the Elm architecture, which encourages um, you to move away from a lot of the problems that I was talking about before, about holding state in odd places, um, uh, not knowing uh, who can update what, not knowing who is the sort of the, uh, the writer of that data. Um, it tries to get around it um, using a few sort of simple rules. So one is that there should be a single flow of data through your application. Um, so in this instance, our data flows from, from our, our model, which is in our view, um, which is what we can see. Uh, we ask for that, that data to be changed. Uh, those requests for those, that data to be changed are piped to the person that cares about it the most, which then generates a new copy of the state, which then gets passed to the view again. So this idea that the application is, is just a big loop of, I want this data to change, please change it in this way, swings around, changes the data, data goes back to view, um, which is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so it's event driven, as I've said, uh, it's pushing events from your view, uh, single source of data. So uh, I said before, there's no state at rest as such. Um, there is, it's just that you don't get to play with it directly. Uh, it sits in the, in the Elm runtime, which is that little box there labeled runtime, uh, which is kind of like a single big store of all of your state, which is something obviously that, you know, um, you wouldn't normally do, say, in an OO application. You don't just have one class with just static members that hold all of your state, because that would be a crazy thing to do. But if you're writing a runtime, maybe it's OK, because you're strict about how that gets used. Um, cool. So it also uh, affords you other um, awesome things like modular abstractions and stuff like that. So you can do composition of all of those parts that you need to, need to work with. So now we're going to look at some code. Um, I hope we'll kind of make some of these make sense and you'll see how it works um, in real life. Uh, so the first example I'm going to show is this, this loop, you know, this idea that you raise an event that gets piped to somewhere that needs to update something, um, which then creates a new model, and that model then gets passed to your new view, which is this constant loop, right? And your view is probably going to create another event. But, uh, so let's go here. So uh, here we've got a widget, which is something on our, uh, which is going to be in our browser. It's going to do something quite simple. It's going to count up. Uh, well, it's going to contain a counter, and we're going to be able to make that number go up or down. Um, so we need a few things. We need to import a few things, um, as you do in any language. We need to use other people's bits of code. Uh, so here we need to use HTML because we're we're in the in the DOM. Um, and we need, to, we need some events because obviously we need to get this, get this circuit moving. So our model is just uh, a type here. So this is um, a record type we were talking about before, so sort of a bucket of properties, if you will. Uh, it's a, got a, one property, uh, which is called account, and it's of type int. Um, is that okay? So I know we didn't go through syntax, but is everyone okay with that syntax? Uh, it's pretty descriptive, I think. Um, so the next thing we might want to do is to, uh, so here we have a, uh, an initial, initial value for our model uh, that we're going to use when we get the application started. So we've got something to get, uh, to get started with here. Our, our count is going to be initialized to zero. Uh, so the next thing that we need in our world of, um, world of code is messages. So messages are the way that we ask the runtime to do new stuff. So our widget, which we want to make a number go up and make a number go down, uh, we need a message to represent those things that we want to do in the application. So here we have uh, increase and decrease, uh, because they're the two things we want to do. You might say that you wanted a message which is change value, and it takes a number, potentially. You, um, but in this example, it, uh, it's quite useful to have two. So we want to, we want to increase, and we want to decrease. So our view then is this function. So we talked before about the fact that um, in a lot of 
especially in Angular, you have this idea of HTML and templates mixing with bits of code. So Elm has a different approach. Rather than using HTML to template out your application, you can do that all functionally. Uh, so every element in the DOM or every element in HTML is a function. So in, in this instance, we've got a div, uh, which is a div tag, uh, which is a function that takes an array of other things, which are things you would put, want to put inside that div. So inside that div, we've got another div, uh, and that div has a text, uh, a text block, uh, which takes our model, um, because that's what we want to be showing in this particular widget. So we want to show our, the count of our model, and then we have two buttons, and those two buttons, one generates our event increase, and one generates our event decrease. So if we click that button, that event will be generated into the runtime, and the runtime will go, right, what do I need to do uh, with this event? So that event will then be passed to our update function, which is our piece of code which then changes that model to then be passed back to our view. So our update here will take our message, uh, which was um, what we raised from the view earlier, and the model, uh, which is our current state of the model. Um, and here we're using a case statement, or which is like a, you know, um, uh, here, to just check the type. So a case statement is like a, like a switch statement or a match statement in, in other languages. Um, so here we're saying like, we're, we're sort of, uh, we're checking the type uh, essentially of the message uh, and then deconstructing it. If it had things inside it, we'd be able to deconstruct those values. There's no values inside it. So here we say, when we receive an increase uh, event, we want to take our existing model and then we can use this little pipe operator um, and in Elm, this is a very useful tool because everything's immutable. Uh, we can't just change the, change the value of count on the model and, and pass it out. What we have to do is we have to take a copy of it and change the values that we particularly want to change. So what this is, what this is saying is it's saying, I want to take a copy of the model, and then on that copy, I want to change this particular value. So in this one, we're taking the original count and adding one to it. Does that make sense? Um, and so that's it. Um, so that's all you ever need to do uh, in an application. I'm going to run that now just to prove uh, that I'm not lying to you. Uh, I'm right. Where am I? So I want to see. Uh, this is quite hard doing this over my shoulder. Uh, and then there. Um, and oh, should I make that a little bit bigger? So I'm going to show you some of the, the command line tools now um, that Elm gives you. Um, so Elm's got a very, uh, I think, healthy approach um, to tooling, which is that everything should be as descriptive, human readable, and, and wonderful and useful as possible. You should be able to do as much as possible from a single command um, on a command line, uh, which is pretty cool. It has a REPL, um, as a lot of sort of scripting languages do. So if you want to do quick prototyping, you can write code um, directly into the runtime and, have, and see, what you, see what you get out. And it also has a very cool uh, little gizmo called Elm Reactor. Um, the idea is that it will host and run your code um, from a folder. So rather than having to build an application, you can sort of host a folder of code um, and then run it directly in the browser. Um, without having to have some sort of build pipeline, which is quite good for prototyping. So I'm going to use Elm Reactor here. And what that does uh, is it starts a server, um, which sits there and listens on that particular folder. So if I go to here and just put into that address, um, which one? Post 8000, here we have um, all of the bits of code and examples we've got there. So we want to see the widget working. Um, so the widget is hosted in application, I'll, I'll show in a minute. So if we go and have a look at that, which is this, which is our build file, we'll see Elm will build it for us. And it's not liking it, which is unfortunate. Uh, it was working earlier. How's it 
Hmm. Uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't matter because it's all being hosted locally. Um, ah, yes, well spotted. That's probably what it's trying to do. So, is there a guest Wi-Fi? That's a look. BCS guest. Uh, I stop the server. <laughs> right, let's try that again. Let's pretend I did this the first time. Right, so it'll build the project. So what it's doing is it's looking at the dependencies on the project and then downloading packages that were necessary um, and then building it and displaying the output of that um, in our browser here. So here we have our... Um, our app, this is our widget, so we have our div that contains our model count and if we click plus it sends that message to increment and if we send the click the minus it sends that message to decrement. Cool. Yeah. That is a very good question. So let's have a look at the application structure for this. So I showed you the widget uh, for the sake of showing us the uh, this kind of view message uh, update um, loop. If we look at the thing that hosts the application or this this widget is this main.elm, which um, which is the thing I ran. Um, this is the bit where these things get wired together into the the runtime. So I wanted to show it without the runtime, and now now I'll, I'll show how it's used inside the runtime. So um, to get our application running in this instance, we need to import that widget, so we're just importing that, uh, that module. The next thing we need to do is uh, create um, an alias for the model for the entire app, uh, which will be that eventually turn into that store that's held in the runtime. Uh, we need to initialize a model, as we did inside the widget, we need to do it at the next level up. Uh, in this case, we're just, uh, we have a model which is for our widget, which comes from the widget's initial model. <laughs> Um, uh, here we also have to do a couple of other things uh, for the sake of the runtime, which is uh, when we initialize it, we need to tell it whether it needs to do anything uh, when it initializes, which is in this instance it doesn't need to do anything. So we use this thing called command.none. Um, I'll talk about what commands are in a minute. Uh, and the application has a certain number of messages that it can handle. Um, and here, this is where we register them. So we say that our widget message um, is whatever the messages are that the widget does. So that's, that's our union type. Obviously this union, uh, this, this widget.message was a union type, so it represents our increment and decrement. Um, and then the next, uh, the next bit is our view, uh, which obviously is incredibly simple because it's the widget. Uh, and then the update function, and this is the bit uh, that I guess uh, answers your question. Um, so when the application needs to handle a certain kind of message, it needs to delegate uh, those messages to where it needs to go. So in this instance, anything that is a widget message has to be delegated um, to the widget. Uh, so if you were, um, uh, yeah, so if you have a number of different uh, blocks um, here, then obviously we would, we, or different widgets, we delegate uh, a specific event to the right widget. Yes. Um, yeah, generally, uh, in this instance, yes, because the thing that's hosting it, that's generating that message is the thing that's passing it down. Um, this could be a point of, uh, of uh, friction for some people, I guess. But I think the idea here is that uh, Elm is that anything that is explicit is much better than anything that is implicit. So, uh, 
uh, which is what you're doing. I mean, this is polymorphism. Uh, what we're doing is we're saying any widget message should be handled by this thing, and then that widget message can be any one of two types. So it's like a strategy or something like that uh, to be handled in there. Um, I think uh, there are strengths to this. Um, like you say, it may, it's maybe unfamiliar in a, to, a, to an object-oriented world, but we'll go into that in a bit. So the next, the next thing we have to do for the sake of our, our application is tell you Tell the application if there's anything external that we care about. And I'll talk about subscriptions in a minute as well. Um, so this is the bit. This is where the magic happens, uh, as it were. So uh, this is the Elm runtime. This, it's a HTML app. So we've said it's being hosted in the DOM. Uh, so our app.program takes uh, this record type, uh, which defines sort of this get going, let's get things going um, object, which takes our initial value, what the view is, uh, what our update function is and what subscriptions we care about and that kind of kickstarts the, the runtime. Um, obviously the, these update view subscriptions are composed from other parts of your application so they should, there should be one app level one but that app level one could be composed of, of a number of different uh, a number of different things. Uh, so that's, that's where the runtime um, gets going and then, and then we wire all the other things up. Uh, cool, so let's look at the next uh, the next interesting thing about the, the Elm runtime. So this is our. That's interesting. Why is it done that? Oh yes, because we zoomed in. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so the next thing uh, that's interesting is oh, composition. Sorry, I should have skipped that slide. We we sort of loosely talked about composition there. Um, so because the uh, uh, the DOM elements are all just those functions for views. Uh, and the same for update functions. They're just as composable uh, as any other uh, you know, piece of functional code. Um, so we can do, uh, we can compose things in the DOM um, in that sort of nice functional way. We can import modules uh, into our view and add them as we did the widget there for our, our main app. Uh, but the next thing I was going to talk about was subscriptions, which I glossed over uh, fairly quickly when we were looking at that main app. So let's look at an example of what those could be. So we have another app here. Uh, this one's a bit more interesting, I guess. Uh, maybe a bit more useful as well in, in the web. So we're going to take some imports from mouse and keyboard. Uh, mouse and keyboard are sources for events that you can take a dependency on in the form of subscriptions. Uh, so once again, we have to go through the, all of the same boilerplate stuff, the same ceremony that you do with every, um, every widget or composite part of your application. We need a model. Uh, because otherwise it's going to be quite a boring, uh, a boring piece of piece of Elm. We need something to initialize this, uh, which is uh, earlier versions of Elm. The app in it uh, was called Fold P. Uh, the idea being that you fold your initial state into the next state with whatever your update function is. Um, I think they got rid of that language because it seemed too functional, <laughs> which I think to a lot of people was um, unfriendly. Uh, so we need some types. So these are messages. Our messages are now not messages that we're creating, but messages that our subscriptions are creating. Um, so we have a mouse position, um, and we have uh, input from our keyboard. And in this case, we care about the code from what's coming from the keyboard. Uh, our view is fairly uninteresting. Uh, our update uh, is going to take, um, take those messages, as it did in the widget. Uh, in this instance, our two messages are our mouse message and our keyboard message. Um, so position and code, this is, these two things have been decomposed because they're, uh, they're sort of values, attributes associated with those messages, but we don't care about them here. You might do, you might care about mouse position in your application, but in this application, uh, we don't because all we want to do is count numbers. <laughs> That's what we do in our business, it seems. Uh, so here we are, so this is the, the bit of magic wiring. So this module uh, takes a collection of subscriptions, which is this batch, so we'll batch those collections up. You can do other things, you can merge um, subscriptions, so if you want something, a message to be produced, if you click uh, the left mouse button and press spacebar, maybe you want a specific message to happen, or if you press control Z, maybe you want a special thing to happen. Um, so you can do other things with subscriptions, uh, but in this case, all we want to do is we want to batch them all up, so we just get a stream of them, um, and then here's our app, our familiar, I hope now, our familiar um, app start. So we're taking those subscriptions um, 
and we're passing them through our update and init. So if we now go to our Elm reactor again, so our server is still running, uh, and look at our subscriptions. Uh, we've got our little count in the corner, which maybe you can't see. Let's zoom in again. And we said that we wanted to do something when we have a keyboard event or when we have a mouse event. So if I click, it increments by one. If I press the keyboard, it increments by two. Amazing. Um, let's go. And what I remember, so our next thing we might care about uh, is commands. So commands are similar to subscriptions in that they're um, they're getting the runtime to deal with something for you. In this case, uh, we're asking the runtime to do something specific that the runtime knows how to do, and necessarily we might not know how to do. Um, so generally, these things are for side effects um, because our our view and our update functions, which are the things that sort of control what our application is doing, have to be pure. We can't have crazy side effects. Um, so what we have to do is we have to ask the runtime to do something side effecty for us. Um, so that's what commands are. So let's go and look at the code. So once again, all the same ceremony as before. We've got our model, we've got our init function, we've got our types here, uh, we've got our message which is our role. So in this instance to generate our numbers, instead of incrementing or decrementing them, what we want to do is we want to create a random one. Um, so when we click a button, we want uh, someone else, not us, to generate a random number. Um, and then we want to display it in our view. So if we look at our view, um, we can see that we have uh, our role message here. And in our update function, we need to handle those two events that we said, which were when we make a role, we want to do something. And the other thing we want to do is when we get a result, we want to do something, a result of that role. So the way we wire that up here is before, um, you may remember, maybe not here, we had uh, an init, uh, we had our model sending our command none, which was because we didn't necessarily need the runtime to do anything for us. Uh, but in this instance, we do. Um, so here, what we're doing is we're taking the same model because we don't need to uh, mutate the state yet. Um, and what we want to do is we want to generate a command which is going to be asking the runtime to do something for us. Now, I've used a helper here because uh, it's, it's kind of easy in this simple example that there is a random.generate, which is a function which creates a command for us. So this is creating a command, and it says when you run that command, this is the message I want you to send. Um, and this is the, the sort of the, the value I want you to, um, to generate for it. So our random generates creates a command which says, when you've completed your action as a command, raise this event with the value that you, you, yeah, you've done here. So here we're creating a random integer between one and six. So this is maybe rolling a d6 if you want to roll uh, something there. So let's go and have a look once again at our, um, our app, all the same stuff. Um, yeah, so our subscriptions there is, that's just a shorthand for the fact that we don't have any, um, have any particular subscriptions here. So if we run this piece of code, I can imagine you might be able to guess what will happen. Um, oh, damn it, if I just, edited the code while I was looking at it without noticing. Yes, I have. Hmm. Well, rather than debugging that, because that'll be quite boring to watch, I think I've edited it while I've been, uh, while I've been showing it. Essentially, you click a button, and it will generate a, a random number between one and six. Uh, so the final thing that you might want to do in your application, uh, well, it's not the final thing you might want to do, but it's the final thing you might want to ask Elm to do for you. Uh, it's a task, 
so a task is similar to a command in that you're asking the runtime to do something for you, but in this instance, it's a future. Um, it's something you want it to do, which maybe is not going to be able to return to you straight away. Um, so the, the most obvious analogy of this when you're working on the web is a web request, right? You might want to ask the server for a piece of data and say, please uh, call this endpoint, give me the data, and then pass that data back to my application. Um, so let's see an example of tasks. Once again, I imagine you'll be fairly familiar with this code now. Uh, it's all very similar, uh, which I think is one of the cool things about, uh, about Elm is it's picked some abstractions um, it's picked some sem sim yeah, sensible and simple abstractions, and then it reapplies them everywhere. So code starts looking very familiar. You might think that there's quite a lot of boilerplate, but um, being explicit, I think, in, in my own view, is, is better than being implicit. So um, I don't mind having to do that. You know exactly what's going on. Uh, so in this instance, our initial model is just a string, and it's empty. Uh, we've got a few types. So in this instance, we've got something happening with I.O., so all sorts of weird things can happen. So what we want to do is we want to fetch something, which is going to be our task, and two things can happen. So we can either have a success, which means we've called that web request and it's passed us back the result we expected. In this case, we just want the string. Um, or we can, there can be some error, right? Something's happened on the web and you know, the, someone switched off the router or they haven't connected to Wi-Fi, whatever it is. Um, so we've got an error, so we won't want to know what that error is. Um, so here we have the HTTP error code. Um, our view, Once again, I'll go very quickly, uh, it's just raising that event, telling us what we want to fetch, so we can get that part of our application going. Um, so here's our, here's our little bit of code that generates our, our task. Uh, our task is an HTTP get, uh, and HTTP get uh, is a nice little helper method to create a task which does something in the web, which is quite useful. Um, it takes a URL, because it needs to know what it's calling on the web, and it takes a decoder. Um, now this is because we have a strict type system uh, in Elm, uh, which means you need to be explicit about the way that you're going to map uh, data from one source to another. This is coming from the outside world, um, which is JSON, uh, which means that it could be absolutely anything. So we need to make sure that our decoder handles only the specific case that we have and returns to us a concrete type that the Elm runtime understands. Uh, so here we have uh, our decoder, which says that at our at name, which is basically just a property lookup, we want to have a type, which is um, a string. Um, so here we can see that our type is a, a decoder that gives us back a string, uh, which is pretty cool. That's quite simple, very functional, and this also means that, uh, ooh, have I gone too far? No, I haven't gone too far. Um, that if there are problems that happen in transit, this has created um, a barrier between us and that outside world. So this, this wonderfully pure world of Elm, of this circulating one directional you know, data flow and all this kind of good stuff, uh, we've been protected from the outside world um, by the way that we've declared our decoder, which is strict, and the way we've declared our error, which is strict. So we're never gonna get something uh, in our application happening unexpectedly because we've made sure that we've handled every possibility, if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of people talk about how Elm doesn't have any runtime errors, and this is why. It's because it encourages you, um, and generally the compiler makes it uh, essential that you handle any possible problem or, or error or otherwise. So here's our, uh, our fetch command. So we're going to perform this, which is, once again, same as we did with our command. What happens when we succeed or what happens when we error? So when we error, raise this event. When we succeed, raise this event. Uh, update function, so we need to handle those events. Very simply, when we fetch, we create a command which is asking the runtime to do something for us. In this instance, the command is a task which is gonna do, it's gonna do something asynchronously for us. Um, and we're gonna have two other events that we can possibly have, so uh, either a success um, or an error, which are our two possibilities. Uh, and then once again, getting this started up. So if we go back to our compiler and go to tasks, hopefully, there wasn't an error in this one, I want editing it as we're talking. So if I fetch, um, this is going to go back to somewhere and ask for some data. So if we look at our network here, um, let's dock that 
because otherwise we'll miss it. So if I fetch, we can see there that the browser went off uh, to do something asynchronously. And once it had completed, the Elm runtime was nice enough to tell us what the answer was. In this case, it's the string tattooing. Cool. So those are our individual bits. Uh, we haven't got enough time to show an example. There is an example. I've included it with the slides, um, uh, which is a more complete example for, with a number of different components um, and uses some uh, build packages, uses Webpack, which is a, a popular build um, task runner uh, to build up an application to, in a, to be in a deliverable state. Um, I think for now that's probably uh, that's probably okay to, as an explanation. So, what do we take home from Elm um, that I quite liked, and what problems did it solve uh, that I had at the beginning? If we can think all the way back, which is a long while ago now, to the problems I had on the web. So, one, there's a single direction flow of information. I don't have to worry about the fact that there are five different components all trying to edit my one piece of state in you know in, in many different ways. I don't have to worry about the fact that the state is stored in the DOM as well as in another piece of JavaScript, because it's all stored in one place, and the architecture kind of makes that happen, which is awesome. Uh, we know that through the mapping of the, the updates, so we saw those case statements flowing the, the messages through the system, um, I know that only the parts of the application that need to change on a given input are going to change. I don't have to, in, in Angular, you have a thing where if you change anything, it doesn't necessarily you know what's changed, so it just has to make sure that everything gets updated. So it recalls every single one of your functions. Uh, and it's got a super rich type system. So all of those problems I had with JavaScript being dynamic and being hard to fathom and being you know, um, horribly changeable at runtime, all that's gone away because the type system has kind of solved that for us. So it feels like Elm is a solution to all of those problems that I had at the beginning. Um, Elm is a solution to all of life's problems. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, but I work in the real world and I work for a company that I can't necessarily spend the time training every developer that works in front-end code how to use Elm. Uh, some of them may not want to learn Elm, um, but they are using uh, a framework and a language and an environment that they're happy in, which is JavaScript, So, and in this instance, Angular. So how can we use some of these ideas, um, which seem like good solutions to problems that I had uh, in another application, surely those things about the architecture that I can apply elsewhere. So it turns out that in Angular, you can. All of the components and, and sort of principal primitives that I was using in Elm are available to you in Angular. It's just not necessary, and in JavaScript, it's not just not necessarily that they're the forefront of it and that the thing you're told to be doing all the time. That doesn't mean you can't you know, make an effort to, to change the architecture, the world you're working in, um, to suit those things. So do we want to be event-driven? So we can do that with, with Angular. It has this idea of emit, um, which is a broadcast, uh, an event handler, um, which is cool. So we've got, we've got a way of raising events, so we can definitely raise events. So a single source of data. So uh, it has this idea in Angular of having services. Services are singletons within your application. The idea being that if any component relies on that service, they're always getting the same instance of it. Well, that sounds like a, we could use that as a single source of data, right? So if we used a service to store our data, anyone that took a reliance on that would, that would be the only, the only place that we'd, we'd be able to get hold of it. So we can do it in, uh, in this other environment. Uh, do we want to be reactive? Well, yes, we've got, we can emit events and we can react to them. And you can use watches, which are like an observable pattern, um, to be able to, to react to those as well. Being type safe, uh, we can use TypeScript. Uh, it's a subset or superset, subset, superset of, jar, of TypeScript. So you can use JavaScript where you want to, but also you can add types to JavaScript if you want to. And it's, it's, it's a less of a barrier because what you're looking at is generally still JavaScript, but we're writing types as opposed to learning a whole new language in a runtime. So that's pretty cool. So my response is try something new, uh, maybe Elm. You might learn something and you might be able to apply it to a lot of the problems you're having in other places. Um, so this was mostly around Elm and how it can solve a lot of problems you might have uh, in the code. But obviously, all of those ideas are pretty applicable to, to anywhere. Um, so that's it. So that's me. Uh, if you want to learn more about Elm, uh, the Elm language uh, front page on the web is, is really good. Uh, and if you want to do exactly this, not necessarily in Angular, there's a few other libraries in JavaScript. So React and Redux 
uh, some libraries which are getting a lot of traction in the JavaScript world uh, and in the DOM, uh, which were based principally on Elm. The guys um, who were doing React and Redux saw Elm. They thought, this is really cool. Let's, let's rebuild it in our own world. Um, cool. So that's it. So, so I take questions. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure on the interoperability, um, specifically those two things, but because it compiles to JavaScript, anything that can interact with JavaScript can interact with Elm. Um, so the Elm program transpiles to JavaScript. So once you've built it, it's just like having a chunk of JavaScript. Um, and that, that's got a lot of interoperability. And I think uh, increasingly uh, more so, I mean, uh, JavaScript's sort of turning up everywhere. Uh, and so a lot of those engines have scripting engines for that. Uh, so as I said before, the, the Elms are walled garden uh, where everything is wonderful and lovely and everything's pure uh, and super functional. Um, but the outside world isn't that world. The outside world is one of fear and mess. So uh, the only way to be able to link between these two worlds is with this uh, thing called ports. So you have to uh, be explicit about defining the interface between your Elm application and the outside world. Um, so as I said before, uh, everything is better to be explicit than implicit. Uh, and it's the same with the error handling, which means that you need to make sure that you can um, satisfy the Elm compiler that you have um, dealt with any possible error you might get from the outside world. So it's, it's type system and the way that you interact with the outside world is quite strict. Um, so yeah, you have to t you take some time to be able to build out those interfaces, but it's, yeah, it's totally possible. Testing, gosh, I have an, I have an example uh, of testing. So if we look uh, at this code base, uh, I'll have to cancel our reactor. See, there's that, there's that change. And we can see here this is our one. So I've changed a file, and I think that's the reason why that thing broke. Anyway, um, we can see that another time. So if we look here, uh, I have a little folder here called tests, uh, which if I open, um, I can have a look Ooh. here. So uh, once again, you have to do the same ceremony that you have to do everywhere else. You need to get it running somehow. Um, so in this, uh, this instance, we've got this run function, which is uh, exported by this tests module, which is uh, a very nice module that somebody um, has added to this world. So we need to, we need to define some tests. Um, so here, it's very similar to the rest uh, of Elm. Uh, We've got something that returns a test. It's very BDD in its style, if that's what you So describe blocks and, um, and that kind of thing. So here we define three tests. Our describe obviously takes a name, which is something that's going to be printed out, and then a list of tests. And the test is just a name of a test and then a lambda. And the lambda is just going to call the function, essentially. Um, and then you're going to expect or assert something on it. So here we, we're asserting that 3 plus 7 is 10. Uh, here we're asserting that, um, uh, I think string left, this is just testing that so there's a character. And then we've got one that fails, a test that specifically fails here. So if we run that uh, in our environment here, so if we go elm test, um, which is a command line tool that gets packaged with the module, it should compile and then run our tests. Um, and we've got a nice output here. So we ran three tests. Uh, in our test suite, and it's printed out only the failures in this instance. So we had that one specific test that just failed, <laughs> um, and that's all it did. So yeah, uh, it's very testable. Like I said before, it being pure um, by design, it's yeah, it's very easy. You just take a function with the given set of inputs. What do you expect to have? Um, uh, and so yeah, that's a, that's a first class thing. Um, yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh, 
Ah. <laughs> yeah. So functionally, uh, polymorphism is generally uh, analogous to, to, to unions, um, where you have a union that has many different kind of forms of, its, of itself. So here we have an animal. An animal can be you know, a cat, a kitten, a dog, and a puppy. Now we might define a function that takes an animal, uh, but generally inside that function you need to be aware of what that animal, animal can be, unless you're maybe you're passing it on to some other function. So um, like yes, uh, never actually um, instantiated. Uh, these things underneath are the things that are instantiated. Now Elm, once again, um, as we talked about before, there's a lot of ceremony involved and you have to be very explicit about things. So um, generically inheriting behavior tends to be if you have to be a member of that set. Um, I, I guess it's a slightly different principle in that activities, methods and functions can be polymorphic, but the types themselves, not so much. So if you wanted to create something that was fairly generic, the runtime would have to know every type that could happen at runtime because it would have to be a member of a known set. Um, so yeah, you don't have, it, it's quite hard in Elm. Uh, I think people are trying to do it and do it nicely so that it's, it's a good programming experience to be able to create you know, a generic thing, which is, um, for instance, you might have take uh, a widget and then what it does is it shows the string representation of it. Um, so like a two-string method, right? it's a very classic kind of um, inherited polymorphic type thing. Most things have a two-string method, which is overloaded or overridden by, by various things. Um, and it's very hard to do because you're trying to be explicit, which means you would have to explicitly um, uh, say what that, that's going to be at, at runtime. So creating a widget that just takes anything and then does something with it is not, um, is very difficult. Um, you know, because you're sort of trying to duct type, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's yeah, that's that's very difficult. Defi de defining, say, an interface that that any old yeah, any can, it, it has to be a part of the set, I guess, which is slightly different. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So if you had behavior that was common. Uh, so in this, uh, this, is, this is my syntax uh, example. So here we have, for instance, you might want to pet an animal. Uh, so you could, in theory, you can pet any animal. Um, and so you take an animal. In this instance, our type takes an animal, returns an animal. Uh, but we need to know what to do with that type at the point at which we do it, not at the point at which we define the type. Because... Uh, because the type system in a class, right, you define the behavior along with the state and the data and you pass that through. In this, this instance, we're not, we're not, it's not being defined in that way, so we need to make sure that at any time we do the function. So it would be more, using the two-string example, um, that we have somewhere a two-string function and then we have to say what every, app, what every, uh, what every type would do uh, to create its own string. So you define... Uh, so it's still polymorphism, but you're defining at the point at which uh, you do it rather than the... It's slightly reversed. Um, it's hard to explain. It's a very different way of looking at things, but I think it's just as powerful. Also, it means that you can't have... Necessarily, it's harder to have behavior that's unknown for certain actions. So if you get past a type and you call two string on it, that might call, that might call the database, right? You have no idea necessarily what that might be doing as long as it uh, implements that interface. Um, Whereas in this instance, you know what that two-string thing is going to do for every type in at that that point in code. I guess it's a different way of codifying it. I guess <laughs> it's just where that block of code is. Um, yeah. Yes, exactly. So we were talking before about being explicit. So in an op uh, I, know I have um, 
another set of slides for a different talk on exactly this subject, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But the, uh, the idea there would be somebody can't introduce a behavior to your application without explicitly talking about it at the point at which the behavior is defined. So you're, you're gearing your code, all code, right? You're codifying a domain, you're codifying a business. So where you put the description or the codification of that thing is different in OO as to where it is in a functional language. In OO, you, you put it along with how you define the shape of your state. Um, whereas in a functional language, the habit is to split the two, to define your state as one thing and then define the way your state changes and the behaviors of your application in another, uh, in another place. So if you added a new type to your system, it forces you, in a language like Elm, to think about every single place where that piece of data could be used and what effect it will have on the behavior of your application, which might be tedious to some, um, but it also might be very powerful uh, because we talked before, I mentioned very briefly, that Elm doesn't have runtime exceptions. Well, that's, the reason, that's one of the reasons why, because you can't have anything maybe happening that's unexpected because you've been forced to expect it. Um, so it's a very different way of thinking about programming, uh, but it's a very powerful way if you have a certain class of problem, I guess. Yes. Yeah, exactly that. Um, and Elms... Uh, no. So in, in a lot of languages, you have a default case um, and this, and the default case is just a default case. You still have to say what you do when you don't care. Yeah. Um, so if you don't define your default case, a lot of languages will say, whoa, you haven't defined what we should do when we don't know what to do. So once again, no runtime exception because you know exactly what's going to happen when you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but yes, in this, in this instance, if I added a fish, then Elm runtime, and their error messages are wonderful prose, they're very explanatory, friendly language would say, what happens in this function when you call it with a fish? I think you need to let me know. Um, yeah, so it definitely would do that. Uh, which is uh, good and bad, because if you introduce a new type, sometimes it's quite frustrating. Like you try to compile your application and it just explodes and says, here are 12 different methods that you haven't defined what you want to do with a fish. But, uh, but that's also, I think, quite good. My last question is about implementation. From uh, 100 lines of how many lines of uh, JavaScript you're getting? Ha! Uh, a lot. Um, so as I said before, the, um, the, uh, uh, the runtime is packaged uh, with the application. So to run, in a f to make sure your application runs in a functional way in the browser, um, it has to package this, this runtime that curries functions for partial application, uh, deals with things like record types and uh, and, and, and uh, a union times which aren't a JavaScript thing. So the runtime is a big chunk of what you get out. So, you know, that's, uh, I, I think it's in the hundreds rather than thousands of lines of JavaScript. But, um, that's that chunk. And then the last chunk is your application, which isn't very much. Um, so it might be uh, sort of 10 lines of Elm, uh, might be 1,000 lines of JavaScript, but 20 lines of Elm will be 1,020 <laughs> um, uh, lines of JavaScript. And there's so. no way to make it compilable? Uh, so Elm, what, compile to machine? Oh, to, to, yes, to binary. Um, so there may be, and I'm Not sure... Not the browser, but make it kind of detach it from the browser. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's work going on at the moment in the community um, to make Elm more portable. It was designed uh, specifically with the DOM in mind and making uh, interacting with uh, browsers functional um, and friendly. Uh, but I think there is work going on so at least the first step would be to have it compiled to JavaScript that could run in Node, which is sort of you know server-side JavaScript, if you want to call it. Um, and then once you've done that, right, the world's your oyster. You can you can then transpile that or, co or compile that down to whatever you want. Um, uh, that's I think that's a very good question. There's um, so it came from a guy whom I can't remember the name of now. Um, a very bright guy um, who sort of wrote the language in his bedroom. Um, I think he, he was just frustrated with using JavaScript. Uh, uh, I think he's an American chap. Um, and then uh, it got traction, I think, with a, a number of people. Uh, he's 
uh, I think he's quite well known in the Haskell um, community, which I'm, I'm not very well versed in, so I was unaware. Um, and I now I think there are a number of people, himself included in the companies he works for, he consults to various companies. And, um, so I think it's being used in production in quite a number of places. Um, I mean, obviously, on the front page, you can list lots of places. You know, they, they talk about Microsoft, Google. A lot of those big players use it to the level at which they're using it, and whether it's the de facto standard um, is not so sure. I think one of a quite a good rule of thumb um, for looking about uh, new things is to look at the I don't know whether uh, the thought works uh, tech radar Elm. Hopefully, that will come right up. Languages of frameworks, technology radar. So ThoughtWorks, uh, a fairly well-respected, I guess, consultancy um, in the IT and software space. So they recently moved Elm as a language um, to the assess stage uh, of their radar, which starts at um, hold, assess, trial, adopt. Um, so it's being um, assessed as being something that they would advise their consultants to use on projects where it made sense. Um, obviously, React and Redux, which I talked about before, uh, have a big uptake because those, those libraries are popular in other worlds. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't vouch. I know the company I work for. A lot of the guys are very interested in Elm. We use it for some select projects, but we're not taking it as our de facto um, uh, language for the front end. Uh, mm, it's, it's being used, I guess, in, in my world as a, as a good tool for learning um, about a way to approach um, application development. Thank you. Wow.